Hi, you've reached the great escapism. We're all home right now. We're the height of the sun in the day. Hey, hey, dude, hello, yo, look, just breathe, all right? Well, I mean, think about breathing, you know? In and out. Yeah, good, probably. Okay, now just think about saying hi, okay? Got it? Just hi, right? So easy. Hi. Feeling anything? Hallelujah, I'm good. <laughs> Come on, you got it. There you go. Oh, I can see the head. Here it comes. Hi. It's a boy? Yeah. Gotcha. How long you been over here? Long? Yeah. You got any concept of time left? I mean, it's a long shot, but usually people can take a guess. Don't get me wrong, it's always way off, but just the ability to guess shows at least a vestigial understanding of having existed. I... Don't exist? Nah, not really. <laughs> Trippy, right? Well, if I don't exist, then what is this? Where am I and who are you? How are we talking if I don't exist? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's a whole philosophical rabbit hole. Been there, done that. Back, you'll find someone interested in talking about that bullshit. But no. You don't exist in the sense of reality that you would call existing. What you are now, what we are now, is more like a ripple in the collective energy of the universe. All that discussion of what is consciousness, is it just individual perception, or is it quantifiable and measurable? Like, am I even real? Or am I just an electronic signal triggering in your non-brain to manifest someone? Or not? You know? You're not R real? Fuck you, pal. I'm as real as you are. As far as you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. You noobs are such easy targets, and it gets so boring in here. I mean, think really hard. What do I look like? Do you recognize me? What do you look like? What do you like? What are you like? What is real about that? What is real about who and what you think you are? Having those perceptions as fixed gives you comfort, makes you feel real in relation to other real things that you also understand. What we are really just energy is cascading through the ever-expanding cavern of the universe. Mm, cavern is wrong. There are no boundaries. The ever-expanding... I don't understand. Wait, shut up. It's coming to me. The ever-expanding... I, I, I can feel my... my I can feel... The ever-expanding... But, but my body is some... Damn it, dude, I lost it. You really need to learn to respect the creative process, man. Like, there's bigger fish to fry than the fleeting needs of your solitary moment. Hey, Jimmy, keeping it real? <laughs> nah, I'm just trying to get like you. <laughs> Stay perceived as black. This is hell. <laughs> is it? Heaven? Is it? Well... Jesus. So. Oh. Hey. <laughs> Didn't know you were over this way again. Mm. I'm everywhere. LOL. <laughs> <laughs> you so stupid, Jesus. <laughs> how, uh, how you been? You know, this and that. Just riding the ripple. Jesus? Oh, shit. Newbie. <laughs> yeah, but he was just leaving. Jesus, um, I... Oh, uh, I, I, are you a fan or something? Uh, Fucking what? hell. Hey, I gotta get away from this. You know, I can't stand these goddamn super fans. I'll check you later. No, wait. Jesus. Call. You know, call me. <laughs> Good one. Laters. That was Jesus? 
yes and no and kind of yeah. That's the ripple of energy that was Jesus. So sort of. The older energies in here, they uh, <laughs> they really know how to manifest together. <laughs> you had sex with Jesus? I mean, yeah. And you might want to chill out if you want a chance next time he's listing by. You're giving off some real intense fanboy energy right now, and it is not the vibe. I'm using that correctly, right? What the, the vibe. Hell? What the hell? How is any of this? God damn it. Yo, what's cracking? <sighs> not now, God. Whoa, whoa. Yo, you called me, eh? Take a chill pill. God, wait. That was God? You really aren't going to shut up about this, are you? Look. You are made up of perception and assumptions. Your perceptions of who you are, what you are, what you believe in, who you believe, who you love, who you trust. These are all perceptions and choices, some based innately on chemistry and some on upbringing and other human trait herd mentality. But those perceptions, those preferences, those ideals are cataloged and recorded in the intelligent machine of your former body as energy. When that energy is no longer housed inside your fleshy mech suit, it dissipates back into the ever-expanding... Expanse. Ugh. Now that's worse, expanding expanse. We are the leftover energy of our lives. We list along, filled with the energy that we lived in. You see me however you have subconsciously decided to perceive me. What did God look like to you? He was... A man. Exactly. White beard, maybe a white robe, Birkenstocks. Um, his body wasn't fully realized. Yeah. See, God sounds like Alanis Morissette to me. <laughs> Watch Dogma too many times. In here, whatever you focused your energy on while you were, quote, alive, is what it feels like, what it sounds like. If you believed in a hell and knew deep down you belong there, your energy holds on to that deep hell truth, and boom, you are in hell for eternity. If you believed in a heaven, in nirvana, and you put your energy into getting there... Welcome to paradise. If you believed in, that's it, close the box and nothing after, your energy is fully composted. The trick is, you can't lie to your energy. Your energy changes and morphs as you grow, but through your actions, through your beliefs, and deep down self-awareness, it fixes in on something more real than the lies you told yourself. So, if you tortured puppies, even if you told yourself it was fine because they don't have a soul or intelligence, there's a part of you. A part of you that came from other energies in this reach. The reach. The ever-expanding reach. Yes. There's a part of you that knows what you did was despicable. So if you spent your life focused on hate, exclusion, violence, abuse, bigotry, welcome to hell. So people who did that are like that screaming thing that went past. Yeah. Yeah people who did that are usually stuck in the pain of regret, hate, and oppression because that is how they lived. People who did that. But if you did that and deep down you knew it was wrong, that could that could save you too? If I did that? No, just... If you did that. If one did that. Ah, the royal you. Hmm, not really. That probably would make it worse. There's a collective and individual knowledge of wrong, so if you have both, then your energy, well, it'll be really fucked up. That's, uh, that's terrible. Yeah, for one like that. But, so, there's gotta be a way to make amends. Amends? Yeah, a chance to make it right. Not in here. You had all your chances. But before, out, out there. Well, if you spend as much energy against those things as you did for them... I think I've met ripples like that here, in the reach. Does that mean you're remembering before? Yeah, some. And I don't look familiar? Why do you keep asking me that? Answer the question! Whoa! <laughs> um, what, what happened to- Good cop? I don't know. I think they're a myth. A myth? What do you mean? You've read books, right? That wasn't rhetorical. Oh, yeah, I've read books. Can't be too careful these days. Well, I think the good cop is a myth, a uh, fable, the opposite of a scary story to tell children at night so they think there's something called justice that's going to look out for them as they grow up. But you know what they say, one man's justice is another man's terror. I don't know if I've ever heard that. No? We must have read different books. 
You still don't recognize me? Why do you keep asking me that? Hey, I'll ask the questions. Do you or do you not recognize me? I don't. You don't? I don't know. I don't. I I feel something. I I can't place it. You feel... How do I feel? Familiar, but uncomfortable. You, I mean. Thank you so much for helping me, but you feel... Odd. Like, I know you, but I don't... Like you. I'm sorry. I know that's terrible to say. You've helped me, but... I'm scared, and uncomfortable around you. So, I feel odd. And I don't know how to stop feeling that way. Wow. That's the most truth I've ever heard you say. Brian. Brian. Or do you prefer officer? Hey, don't get smart. Oh, I'm sorry. You're full of apologies suddenly. Why did you call me that? Officer, because you're a pig. Oh, I mean cop. Tomato, potato, officer insinia. Brian insinia. Yep, that's you. Right. And you're... Guess. Guess? I'll give you a hint. Not Rebel Stiltskin. I think we're done here. Ooh, not quite yet. I'm leaving. (laughs) I don't think you'll be able to, newbie. Damn it! Well, the... Tell me, how how, how the hell do I... Oh, wow. This has been better than I imagined. (laughs) I'll help you. Just calm down a sec. I'm calm, okay? Now what? I'm calm. How do I move? Please. First, empty your mind. Focus on your breath once again. Just notice how you feel as breath enters and leaves you. Think back to your former body. Imagine how it moves as you breathe. Think about the most comfortable, restful bed you've ever slept in and how rejuvenated and at peace your mind and body felt laying in that bed. You are only there in that moment with your breath. Now think about how you'll never, ever, ever experience that ever, ever again. Wait, what? In three, two... Ow! What the fuck was that? That felt like a cattle prod. Ow! Hey, what the hell? Did you do that? Me? I didn't do anything. You did that. Jesus! What is that? Even if it makes our own country an ice fire electric sphere being rammed into my spinal cord. Mm-hmm. Ow! Ah! Ah! <laughs> That's you! Don't you recognize yourself? But I I was okay. I was saved. (laughs) Not even a little bit, Officer Brian. You know, I may have forgotten to mention that when your collection of energy first returns to the Reach, there's a bit of a lag before the nature of your energy catches up to your perception of yourself. I was threatening you. Said you feared for your life. You did what you did to help me in the dead. And now... Nah, exactly. (laughs) Enjoy whatever length of time you perceive to be a proper amount of punishment. Don't worry. It's not really eternity. It just feels like it. (laughs) Don't tell me you lost your sense of humor now. Damn, Sandra, you cold as ice. Fuck off, God. Untethered is written by Raphael Jordan. Performed by Michelle Beck. Patrick Andrew Jones, and Ian Eaton.
The Great Escapism is produced by Jennifer Downs and John Pena Griswold through New Ambassadors Theatre Company. Hi, you've reached The Great Escapism. We're all home right now. Those are my friends. Gonna go take a walk with them while six feet apart. We're in quarantine. You can't go hang out with your friends. Six feet apart, though. Six feet apart is the arbitrary distance you should keep when walking alone on the streets to avoid contamination while doing essential tasks, not while meeting up with people. Ugh, but quarantining is so boring. I'm not gonna go to your drive-by funeral, Willow. <gasps> Shh! I think I'm getting through unemployment this time. If I get it, everything will be fine and you can do whatever you want. Welcome to the New York State Department of Labor Unemployment Insurance Claims Line. To continue in English, press 1. We're sorry. We are experiencing an extremely high volume of calls right now, and all of our agents are busy assisting other callers. Please call back. Beep. Fuck! <laughs> How many times have you called today? 718. I think I'm gonna go for a thousand. Oh, well, I like round numbers. Hey, Margo, do you think we're in hell? Well, hell is nice if we still get to text and FaceTime our friends. While we wait for death. Do you remember that episode of Family Guy when Chris said, hell is where the dead believe they're still living and they pray for death, but death won't come. I've never watched a television show in my life, but I do know that quote from the Bible. Well, we're waiting for this virus to come kill us, but it will never kill us. Plenty of people have died from it, Willow. Uh, I'm saying maybe we already died from it. Does the absurdity of it all not seem odd? Eh, real life is stranger than fiction. Oh, look, the president is on TV. Let's see what touching thing he has to say today. So sacrifice your nans, or I'll withhold what you need to stay alive. Ugh. We're sorry. We are experiencing an extremely high volume of calls right now, and all of our agents are busy assisting other callers. Please call back. Beep. Fuck. Huh. The, the repetition of it all. Forget it. <sighs> I have a Zoom meeting happening in two minutes, and Zoom just keeps opening up, shutting down, opening up, and then shutting down again. It's like I'm not meant to get through to anyone. <laughs> Prepping for a meeting that will never happen. The repetition of it all. Um, hey Willow, you never told your friends you couldn't meet them, did you? You're right. Because you don't have to. Because it doesn't matter. Tomorrow they'll come and... And you'll, you'll shame me and I, I won't go see them. If only 200,000 people died, we did good. If everyone dies, if everyone we, died, did we did better. better. Isn't that my face on TV? Margot Dean, age 32. And mine. Willow Myers, age 30. Uh, I'm never getting through unemployment, am I? Lo sentimos. Estamos experimentando un alto volumen de llamadas ahora y todos nuestros agentes están ocupados ayudando a otros usuarios. Por favor, llame más tarde. Beep. I didn't know you spoke Spanish, Willow. Can you at least get me through to unemployment? Now you're a beeper. <laughs> Very multilingual, are we? If you don't stop beeping right now, I'm calling 911. Hello? <gasps> there is no connection to the outside world. Is there? We're, We're sorry. sorry. We are experiencing an extremely high volume of calls right now, and all of our agents are busy assisting other callers. Please call back. Please call back.
Hellscape, We're Sorry is written by Kendra Augustine, performed by Arya Kashyap, Zenny True, Todd Butera, and Julia Butero. The Great Escapism is produced by Jennifer Downs through New Ambassadors Theatre Company. Hi, you've reached the great escapism. We're all home right now. Hello, and welcome to Sounds of the Past, the last radio program broadcast over the airwaves. As always, I'm your host, Olivia Shears. Later in the hour, we'll hear my conversation with the governor of New Jersey, Laura Larimar, on her controversial plans to remove the remaining radio towers in her state. But first, straight into my recent boundary-shifting discussion with Samantha Zimmerman. Yes, that Samantha Zimmerman. I want to pause here and say that there's no real journalistic precedent for this interview. After some reflection, I still can't say I'm totally comfortable with it myself. That being said, it's a new world we live in, and the old guard likewise must adjust. Samantha and I, we had a chance to chat a bit before we started recording, if you can believe it. It was? Well, I'll just play the interview and let the listeners experience it with you. It's recording? Uh, it should be now. Yes? Yes. Hold on, hold on. Uh, you can hear me fine? Yes. It's strange. I don't know why that makes me uncomfortable. Would you like me to stop it? No, it's all right. You sound nervous. <laughs> well, I've been doing this a long time, but I'm always nervous. Really? You always sounded so calm. So reassuring. You listen to my show. Grew up on it. Well, uh, we should get started. Do you think I'll be able to listen to this when you've finished editing it? I honestly don't know. They haven't explained all the rules. Right. I mean, I can always... Uh... It's all right. Okay. Samantha, if you're ready, shall we start? Sure. <clears throat> Okay, Samantha, I want you to take us back to the beginning. I know it's not the easiest thing to talk about. Why else am I here? I was hoping you could tell me. Right. So, from the beginning. Please. Okay, so the interface dated back to 2029. But, forgive me, we all know the official history of the interface. When does it all start for you? Okay. Two years earlier. I was in graduate school, getting a master's in what we called comp psych, or computer psychology at the time. It was a newer discipline. Most would recognize it as comp thought in today's academia. Is that right? I believe so, yes. Okay. They don't tell me much. I hear bits and pieces, but... So, 2027. Right. So, at that point, I had a roommate, Margaret O'Connor. She was my best friend in the world. She was also a comp psych master's student, but... I don't know. Uh, not in the way I was. Or the way my classmates were. Not in the... She was really more of a poet. I mean... Literally, she was always writing, but she also, she attacked her studies through poetry, through metaphor. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. You don't often hear poetry and comp psych in the same sentence. Right, people never <laughs> seem to. Back then, we had a measurement for that kind of thinking when it came to machines, the lateral second level processing and automated thought. In layman's terms. We do try to keep our dwindling audience on board. <laughs> right. 
Um, so, okay. If you had a self-examining program, a program that was able to evaluate its own processes to try and optimize them, a program that had, I'm going to call them opinions, which any developer would scoff at. Sure. But if you had a neural network that shifted too heavily towards the task of examining its own inner workings, we called that a preoccupied system. So Margaret and I joked that she was preoccupied, as a couple comp psych nerds are wont to do. I want to pause here. I know that many of our listeners will have a strong sense of what Margaret was like, but how was she with you, one-on-one? -on -one? What might the average listener not know? She was reserved, actually. I mean, sure, when she was in a position where she was encouraged to share, she was just word vomit, thought after thought, a waterfall of affect. Social media. Yes. She was obsessed with social media. Which, for our listeners, is an old term used uh, yes, to... Yes, an old term for what we now think of as interface. But she was actually on the old school tethered social media platforms. I mean, she was on Face in 2027 when the network was almost completely deserted. But she was there, sharing little poems, thoughts, angers in a way we don't really do anymore. Why do you think... She'd joke that it was some kind of long-term art project, but I always thought it was more about pouring herself into a place that used to belong to more people, like an abandoned building. Margaret liked filling up space and hated it. But she was connected to the interface, too. Of course, she was connected to everything. <laughs> the daily usage of the interface at that time, on average, uh, was something like four hours a day for our people our age. Margaret was interfaced like eight to nine hours, more when she was depressed. I'm sorry, I shouldn't... It's all right. I know it's not on the record, and I know her mental state is still a... God, it's disgusting for me to talk this way, but it might still be an important legal issue, so I don't... Samantha, to... you don't have to... I'm not saying I know more than anyone else, but I do know... The moment I heard about her accident, my heart stopped, and I didn't question for a moment that... That she had taken her own life. Yes. If you're not comfortable, we can circle back. I hadn't heard from her for a couple days, which wasn't that abnormal, but I was concerned. So I reached out. I sent her a message on Face. Nothing. What'd you say? I think I'd prefer not to. No, of course. Anyways, I don't... <laughs> There's not much that I remember after that. There's sort of a, a black hole in my memory. It's eerie. I can't access it. I just dropped away for a time. What do you remember next? Margaret answered my message. So the story goes, and legally, there's still a bit of unanswered. Um, I don't really know what to say or what consequences legally. It's all right. You can just... I'm not trying to be... No, I know. But everything you say is protected. We'll edit out anything we need to at the end. Okay. Okay. It bothered me that she didn't respond. That's the only way I could... It didn't make sense. And it wasn't fair. I'm sensing that you feel judged for your role in this. Aren't you judging? Isn't that what this is about? Not for me. I'm sorry. I don't know that I believe you. I'm trying to do my job. Journalist. I... Sure. Objectivity and all that. I'm familiar with the notion. Samantha. I know now that what I did was a violation. What was? I was out of school at this point. I was cleaning my old hard drives from college. Everyone my age was deleting their old data, at least those of us in the tech world. I booted up my old laptop and found myself navigating straight to log into my interface, just like muscle memory, you know? So 
Already I'm feeling nostalgic because all of the common faces from two years prior popped up and they were all obsolete. <laughs> right. Right. This was 2029. The face market was volatile. Everyone was on 12 different faces just trying to keep up. Well, I think you were younger than me. Sure, but how many were you on? None. Oh. I've never been on anything. Oh. Was that weird for you? Uh, no. It's... I, I don't know that I've ever met anyone. We exist. Apparently. We can talk more about that later. Sure. You were logging back into old faces. Why weren't you on them? <sighs> I'm sure our listeners don't want to hear me rage against the machine. I think it's relevant. Okay. I'm not trying to be rude. No, I take your point. Oh, we can move on. I just didn't have the energy. I'm from the generation that coined the term self-care. And trust me, we were considered vapid and self-centered for that at the time. But it frustrated me to see that same term start to apply to people pruning their online profiles. We used to talk about doing work on yourself and finding yourself. And suddenly everyone was doing all that work on a surrogate self. And it is hard work. It is. I digest ideas for others every day, and I can tell you it is painstaking work to profile someone with any true insight. Why waste that time on some invented person? It's obfuscation. It's the opposite of clarity. It's very much besides the point. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm getting on my soapbox now. <laughs> I think it's interesting. You were logging back into your old interfaces. All right. Fine. I was logging back in, and well, I finally got around to the face, which I had last messaged Margaret through. I was hesitant to log on, because I hadn't really since. Um, but I went to log on, and there was her username. Auto filled in. Her password autofilled too. She, she had sometimes used my computer, and we were like sisters, so she trusted me. I wish I could say that my intentions were pure. Even at the time, I think I was telling myself that I was trying to recover her profile for her mother, who had been trying to get access for months, but again, she had so many. I went straight to her messages. I had to see what I sent her. From her point of view, I, I had to know... Why? Morbid curiosity? I just wanted to see the message I had sent her on her profile through her unique user skin. I tried to imagine what she must have. I mean, I couldn't help myself. I couldn't help but start... typing a reply from her account. To try and get some sick closure, maybe, but I didn't expect. Um, I started with just my name, Samantha. And the autocomplete suggestion started popping up. I hadn't anticipated. Um, and the top suggestion was the word sorry. So I clicked it, then the word I'm came up, then preoccupied. And I stopped there. I shut the computer down. I literally threw it across my bed. I couldn't, I couldn't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I also didn't wipe the hard drive. All right. Let's fast forward a bit to September that year. Fast forward to September. Uh, I'm pitching a new interface in Atlanta, as every unemployed kid with my degree was doing after the crash. And I'm pitching Death Book, which is... Mostly a joke at the time. <laughs> no, really. It was the stylish thing to do. Pitch a creative, tongue-in-cheek, but totally infeasible face to businesses. Knowing they'd reject it, of course, but hoping that they'd notice you and hire you on to whatever project they were going to greenlight. And so, death book? It was a way to communicate with the dead. So you were saying you earnestly didn't know it would take off? No. I mean, I had one user at the time. Which was Margaret. Right. Although I made up a pseudonym for her, Annie. Why do you think? Fear. Okay. But I was saying... Yes? I originally thought, who's gonna care? 
that I put together a clumsy approximation of a person's uh, of a composite of one person's overzealous online presence, but I guess I never considered how much people would like her specifically. There was more to its initial success, though. No, of course. No one had considered the novelty of, of, of the different mediums. I wasn't the first to plug in what was essentially artificial intelligence into a messaging service using inputs from a real personality, but I was the first to do it across a variety of platforms with data that was pulled from real life, not lab conditions. Because in reality, we all expressed ourselves differently on each network. It gave a complexity to the... I hate calling it AI. I really do. But it gave a complexity. There were contradictions across manifestations, and the outputs evolved. You'd interact with her professional profile, and she'd respond differently to your text faces or your music faces. Even the traditionally cold, calculated, government-issued interfaces showed response. Little bits of character. And then Nova bought it. Nova bought my interface. Now suddenly this face that I never meant to show the world was being picked up by a company that was, at this point, the only producer of new faces. What were they hoping to get out of it? Honestly, I think it was a novelty product for them. A human interest project to show that they were pushing boundaries and not just the bottom line. I'm sorry, but I want to call attention to this idea that you keep repeating. The death book was merely a way to show off your skill? It was. But wasn't it more about preserving Margaret? I hadn't interacted with her since that first message. Oh, I have a hard time believing that. Honest. You can check the logs. Not anymore. Right. <sighs> Not anymore. But I, I didn't. I suppose you'll have to trust me on that. I didn't. I had others test her. Okay, but why? You don't believe me. You think I'd lie? Not lie, no. I'm here to get your side of this story. I am. But I'm just not sure exactly which facts we can be entirely certain of, particularly when we're talking about the lack of an event. I take everything you say at face value, but how do we know what you don't know? Is that fair? Um, can we move on? Of course. Where, uh, where were we? Okay, uh, you're now a newly minted head designer. Part of the pun, at Nova. Right. I'm in talks with them ahead of my official start date, and they're really going out of their way to be, you know, hands-off in a way I didn't expect. They had recently bought into the idea of... Again, this is when meta-analytical preoccupied systems are gaining steam, and they're interested in cultivating a brand new wing of their platform. They're telling me that they're interested in an unadulterated evolution of my project. They used those words? Oh, yeah. What did that mean to you? It meant that the project led us, and not the other way around. When did you open it up to more users? Officially? Unofficially. The day I moved into my office at Nova, before I had even unpacked, I had strangers knocking on my office door. This was supposed to be an extremely secretive project, but I had everyone from interns in other departments to junior executives poking around. Some of them brought old laptops. That day, my first day, and here I am, a young woman who's deeply in debt from school, first real job at the top employer in the nation, and executives are shoving outdated laptops in my face, asking if I can bring up their dead brother, their dead mother, their dead kids, for Christ's sake. It was that immediate. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I couldn't. Not only professionally, because, mind you, Citizen Online had just been passed by Congress the year before. The largest shift in privacy law in the country. In the world. The U.S. government yanked the use of private info from every interface. And 90% of interfaces topple overnight. Right. And jobs vanish. Oh, yes. But now, people are doing this extraordinary thing. They're shoving private information down my throat. They're attempting to bribe, to even threaten in some cases. You were threatened? Yes. That came more later with phase two, but there were threats even from the start. Just the idea of interacting with a loved one. And Margaret. And Margaret. The infamous blip. She was grandfathered in. I couldn't. This is literally my first day. I couldn't customize new software. 
even if I wanted to, the demo that people were allowed to try, without my permission, I might add, the robustness of, of the, the lifelike Margaret couldn't even be approximated by the meager data of some recently deceased octogenarian who hardly knew how to interface versus versus nine hours a day. Yes, but nine hours a day of poetry. So I plugged them in together. I cheated. I told them I can't get a coherent conversation with you and your fill in the blank, but I can show you how they, you know, interact with Margaret. I plugged them into the same network and I let people watch. Flies on the wall of how two people might keep responding to each other. Posts, comments, likes. Simple little ones and o's, but eerily lifelike. God, so eerie. And did they? Oh yes, they did. Some of them, anyway. And as I've learned, if enough eyeballs turn to something you think belongs to you, you start to lose it. Phase two. Yes. Within a year, we were public with it. Strict rules. Only a few interfaces per person. We needed total confirmation of familial consent. We needed certificates of death. We needed social security numbers. But we could put your loved ones in... The Death Garden. I never liked that name. Me neither. <laughs> I guess we have that. Um, but yeah, uh, the rules were simple. It was supposed to be simple. What do you think complicated it? Money. What else? We should note that the interface was ostensibly free. Always. I insisted. But that didn't stop others from trying to profit. It never does. I mean, the consultants were inevitable. We actually interviewed one for a segment a few months back. I wanted to play for you a clip of that audio. Uh, 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 sure. All right. This is a clip from April's segment with Joe Lyson, a mortician from Patterson and a once popular death garden consultant. Yeah, I mean, listen, my family owns a funeral home. My whole life, my father's whole life, his father, stretching back, I don't know, a hundred years, we've operated this funeral home. And let me tell you, every single client that walks through the door brings their own convictions about what death means, what really happened to their loved ones. Half the job is just frowning and nodding. I got a lady coming in on Tuesday who needs a certain kind of soil because she swears her husband will be able to tell. I've got another one coming in on Thursday who can't have any meat in the building or his brother might not reincarnate correctly. I believe what you're saying... What I'm saying is that you don't judge the way people try to grieve. The way they memorialize the dead. That's rule number one. I mean, every method is crazy if you think about it. The way we hem and haw over corpses and flowers and what, what picture to use for the programs, we slave over these decisions. So when the death garden comes around, me and my family, we're used to stepping in and helping people put lipstick on a corpse, so to say. Often literally. We're used to guiding people's hand and finding a remembrance that fits their needs. For a fee. You goddamned right for a fee. We'd been selling a service that cleans up the internet presence of the recently deceased since before we were calling them interfaces. And we were helping write eulogies, obits, and epitaphs since before there was an internet. Suddenly, there's a way to do all that for somebody, except now it's in the first person. Everybody wanted to see and hear a little more from their loved one but preferably a version that's a little less dumb, a little less petty, uh, a little less racist, you know? So we did data dumps in the interface, tricked the algorithms, dressed up their online life in a way that would give them a happier time knocking around in the goddamn death garden. You sound like you don't approve. That thing made me a wealthy man for as long as it lasted. <clears throat> But, uh, I don't know. You get real cynical when your business is death. You lose all superstition. You have to. But there's something about that electronic purgatory. The week it came out, I, I changed my will. I specified in no uncertain terms that I would never consent to being sent to anything like that. Or whatever kooky new version they'll program on 100 years from now. Not me. 
I'm not superstitious, but bury me deep. What's your reaction to that? I don't know. I, again, I understand his discomfort, and your discomfort, and everyone else's discomfort. This is all so far from what I intended. Which was? To hear from Margaret. Which precipitated what some are calling Phase 3. Right. Her parents sued. Margaret's personality was still under the pseudonym at this point, Annie. Sure, but to anyone who knew her, it was obvious it was her. But she was the backbone to this whole system. At this point, we had maybe 800 others in the system, but she was the first. And she was so good at it. She guided the newcomers into their little world. We never told them, God, if you can call it, um, we never indicated to the profile that they were dead. But it's like she knew, like she was the welcoming committee. In more uh, technical terms, the interface we created responded to the inputs of the profiles and adapted, so her being the first, there was some bias towards the way her profile saw things. And people saw that. Her thoughts permeated. It was her. Eventually, her parents saw it, and they hated me for it. Why? Did you ever talk to them? Only through legal channels, but I, I, I feel like I don't want to get in trouble. No, of course. I feel like they weren't being honest. How do you mean? I don't know. It's okay, Samantha. Uh, no, it's nothing. An error. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Long story short, they sued. They wanted it taken down. Death book. Her. They wanted me to delete Margaret. And I couldn't. How did Nova react? They fought tooth and nail for me to keep the project afloat. Most of our legal team and all of our engineers were looking for a way to surgically remove Margaret to cover their bases while keeping this insanely popular, insanely in-demand service alive. We had people come in daily, cash bribes in hand, but it started shifting. How? We were getting requests from the still living, people looking ahead and doing everything they could to prepare. Everyone was acting differently. There has been no shortage of think pieces. No, for sure. The death of the unexamined life. Because suddenly, to stop trying to record yourself, to stop trying to get every angle of your being out there on the digital record meant to risk missing something. What do you say, and I'm not trying to antagonize here, but what do you say to the people who called it a religion? I've never been religious myself, but seeing so many people abandon living their actual life in search of a better second round, that's what it looked like to me. But again, in an age where no one, and I mean no one, legally was allowed to solicit a gram of autobiographical information from fear of harsh penalties from the government, people were lining up to sign every possible legal document saying we had full use of their life's data. They'd drop off packages of hard drives, of passwords, of raw video of themselves and their loved ones trying to get in the garden. And then the O'Connors won the case. Yep. And before I could get home from court, she was gone. Again. Again. And then what happened? You know. We don't, really. Not from... And then I killed myself. Is that what you want? I'm sorry. It's fine. It's not. It's fine. What was next for you? <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. I know some of the other surviving voices call it deja vu, but it's not. It's like you've seen every color or heard every sound. You don't realize that you're constantly hearing new sounds and seeing new colors in the world until it stops, until you've gotten your quota and you're only allowed to rearrange it. I don't know. I know the others aren't as. I suppose my circumstance is harder. Or maybe I've just seen how the sausage is made and now 
in death, it's just boring. <laughs> Maybe it always was. Maybe we wanted to make it more, but it's always been more boring than we'd like to admit. I think we can leave it there. Yeah? Would you like to see anything more? No. I've said my piece. I don't have anything new to say, and I don't think I ever will. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Olivia. If I wasn't at all, I hope you didn't feel... I'm really glad you talked to me today. Samantha? Okay. Got it. That's it, then. That was Samantha Zimmerman, the deceased visionary behind the Death Gardens. If you want to learn more about Samantha, you can visit the Museum of Modern Science in New York City, where Samantha and 14 other personalities deemed historically meaningful are preserved and active in the only sanctioned legal death network in the country, pending litigation. Although incredibly private when she was alive, Samantha donated her body and entire digital history to science, including thousands of hours of voice diaries used to construct the first voice chat interface in the Death Garden. NPR would like to graciously thank the Museum of Modern Science and the Library of Congress for this rare and exclusive use of the audio interface. Preoccupied is written by John Pena Griswold, performed by Jennifer Downs, Casey Hamilton, and Celeste Rich. The Great Escapism is produced by Jennifer Downs and John Pena Griswold through New Ambassadors Theatre Company. Hi, you've reached The Great Escapism. We're all home right now. Name, please. Where am I? Name, please. Luden Clegg. You're not on the list. I'm not? No. What does that mean? You can't get in. I can't? No. Is there any particular reason why I'm not on the list? I'm sure there are many. Does it... Does it mention anything in particular? No, sir. You're not on this list. This list? There are other lists? There's one other. Where do I go to find out if I'm on that list? Downstairs. Oh, I see. Would you mind stepping aside? Name, please. Sylvia Langley. Sylvia? Oh. Hello, Luden. You may enter. She knows me. <laughs> Barely. We worked together for eight years. Please don't hold that against me. We understand. Sylvia. Couldn't you do something? Put in a good word for me? Stop harassing the patrons, please. Sylvia! Luden! What? There's nothing I can say, and honestly, I'm not sure if I would. But we worked together. No, Luden. I worked. You and the rest of the boys' club ordered me about, forced late-night work sessions so I couldn't be with my daughter, suffocated me with your disgusting macho bravado and then took all my work and put your stamp on it. That was Crabtree. He was the managing partner. Sir, please step away from the rope. Your wrist, please. Oh, what's this for? It gives you unlimited access to the open bar and all-you-can-eat buffet. Oh, do they serve Indian food? They serve everything. Lovely. You know, Luden... I can forgive you and Crabtree for all those other things, but that last stunt you pulled, that was all you. Arrogant and selfish, deep down to the tiniest bone in your fat little body. Hey! So no, there's nothing I care to say in your favor that would put you on that list. Sylvia! What did I do? Sir, 
Do I have to call security? No. I'll... <sighs> Names, please. Zachary and Samantha Clements. I have a Samantha Clements. No Zachary? No. That's odd. Same thing happened to me. Did you try downstairs? Not yet. We went there first. There was a mix-up in Zach's case, but once I explained it wasn't really his fault, they rerouted him. There was a lot of paperwork. We've had such an influx lately, there was bound to be some confusion. I'm glad you got it sorted out. It took forever. They said the transfer would go through automatically? Not yet. God damn it. Zachary, what did they just tell us? Sorry. Sorry, I haven't eaten in a long while. There's an all-you-can-eat buffet inside. I'm vegan. We've got you covered. Do I know you? I don't think so. Oh, he has paperwork. Zach, show him your paperwork. Sorry, it's all wrinkled. I see what's happened. You're very lucky she arrived with you. These things become a lot more complicated otherwise. Here you are, Zachary Clements. You're all set. Oh, thank God. Zachary! Great! I, I meant great! Through here, please. M maybe my name is there now, too. Sir, I won't tell you again. Can you at least check? It's not. Wrist, please. You didn't even look. There's an open bar, too. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 that's my cousin Jake in there. Jake, hey, Jake! If you let me go find my cousin, he'll vouch for me. I'm sorry, sir, we can't allow that. But he'll vouch for me. It's against the rules. John! John Crabtree! Boy, am I glad to see you. Hey, Moody, what's going on? Uh, trying to get in, but... I'm not on the list. Oh? Crabtree, John H. Sylvia Langley went in a little while ago. Yeah? I'll have to thank her. Thank her? Am I on the list or what? Yes, sir. Ah, thank God. What's going on? I was waiting downstairs in a room where I sat forever filling out paperwork. Finally, this dude shows up and tells me I'm being redirected. Puts me in an elevator and here I am. Apparently, something Sylvia said. What did she say? Who cares? The beast being downstairs, that place is a bureaucratic nightmare. It's hell. Uh, you can say that again. John, you've got to help me. Talk to someone. Try and get me rerouted. Wrist, please. What's this? It gives you unlimited access to the buffet. <gasps> oh, any place where I can get a drink? There's a cash bar. Damn. All I have is plastic. <laughs> Ludi, oh boy, you got some cash I can borrow? Well, <laughs> you already owe me. S sorry, no. No worries. There's got to be an ATM inside, right? Closest one is downstairs. Oh, the hell with that. I'm sure Sylvia will lend me a few bucks. John, don't forget me. Huh? Sure, Ludi, sure. I'll do what I can. Ah, now this is more like it. I thought I heard someone call my name. Jake! Oh, Jake! Oh, it's you. Oh, it is so good to see you. What are you doing here? Well, I, I, I'm trying to get in, but this guy keeps telling me I'm not on the list. I should say not. What? I don't care if you want to be reckless with your own life. But once you start putting other people at risk... Wait, 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 what are you talking about? What are the people? Grandma. What's wrong with Grandma? And Aunt Agnes. And Uncle Jeffrey. And the Marxes. And Leona Hunt and her three girls. And Mr. Carmelo from the corner store. And God knows how many other people from the neighborhood. What's happened to them? Jake! And let me tell you something else, Luden Clegg. If it weren't for the strict code of behavior they got around here... I'd be kicking your keister right now. What did I do? Sir. All right, all right. I gotta get back inside anyhow. Marty's probably wondering where in hell I am. Wait. Marty's inside? Everybody's inside. Yeah, but, but y you just said... Jake, what's going on? If you don't know, I'm not gonna be the one to tell you. <laughs> He's kidding, right? Hey, all those people... I'm beginning to understand. 
You're supposed to be in that special place. Yes, here we go. Luden Clay. There's a spot reserved for you there. Oh, is that the uh, VIP section? You could say that. Ah, how do I get there? Go down the hallway there, turn right, and you'll see an elevator on the left. Here, I'll show you. There's only one button to push. It'll take you directly to Subsuite 9, where you'll be met by your valet. Ooh, sounds fancy. Yeah, I, I knew there had to be some kind of mix-up. I'm actually a really nice guy. I deserve this. You do. No hard feelings, then. None whatsoever. Good. Here you go. Just push the button there. Enjoy eternity. Thanks. Hey, tell me. What was it I did to get such preferential treatment? You didn't wear a mask. Ha! <laughs> You're joking. We never joke about a thing like that. Oh. Oh, holy shit! Excuse me, sir. I think I may be lost. Name, please. That Special Place is written by David Adam Gill. Performed by Ben Dworkin. Mark Hoffmeyer, Maria Elena O'Brien, Mandy Murphy, Paul Packler, Todd Butera, Celeste Rich, and Julia Botero. The Great Escapism is produced by Jennifer Downs and John Pena Griswold through New Ambassadors Theatre Company.